Hello, I'm Peter Baxter, Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. It's a great pleasure to introduce this podcast. In it, we're going to be discussing the article, The Etiology of Neonatal Seizures and the Diagnostic Contribution of Neonatal Cerebral Magnetic Resonance Imaging, which is authored by Lauren Vika, Floris Grunendahl, Mona Teut, Manon Benders, Rutger Nievelstein, uh, Linda Van Roy, and Linda de Vries. It's in the March 2015 issue of the journal. It's going to be discussed by Dr. Lauren Vika, who is a PhD student, and Linda de Vries, who's professor in the Department of Neonatology, Wilhelmina Children's Hospital, Utrecht, Netherlands, and by Dr. Sarah Berkey, who's a Pediatric Neurology Research Fellow at the Department of Neurology, Children's Hospital, and University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, who's also authored a commentary on the article. Please let me start with you, Lauren, to outline the paper and its background. Uh, we performed a retrospective uh, cohort study of 378 children, term or near term, so born after a gestational age of 35 weeks, who had clinical or subclinical seizures that were confirmed by AEG or EEG. They also had a ultrasound and MRI during their admission, and we studied them over a 14-year period. They were admitted in our center in the Netherlands, and what we investigated were the etiologies, uh, the underlying etiologies, also the MRI patterns uh, that we found per etiology, and finally, the main focus of the paper, we wanted to evaluate the diagnostic value of MRI in addition to cranial ultrasound by comparing the MRI results with the ultrasound results and defining the value of MRI in three groups, being no additional value of MRI where all lesions were seen by ultrasound, additional value of MRI where some lesions were seen on ultrasound but MRI added to the information or showed additional lesions, and finally, those that were completely diagnosed by MRI. And what we found in our paper is in the majority, almost 94%, we found an underlying etiology. The most common ones were hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, intracranial hemorrhages, and arterial ischemic stroke. And in about 12%, MRI was definitely essential since we would have missed the diagnosis if MRI would not have been performed. And percent ultrasound showed all lesions, but also in 40% of the cases, MRI contributed significantly to the diagnosis or um, showed additional lesions which were important for more accurate prognosis, uh, more focused testing, or genetic counseling. So that's the basic uh, results of our study. I think these are very interesting and important data. Thank you for um, summarizing and giving a brief outline. Perhaps to begin with, I would like to ask you about the prevalence, morbidity, and mortality of the condition of neonatal seizures, and what interested you to research this further? Well, the prevalence of seizures in full-term infants, since that was the main focus of our paper, is about 1 to 3 per 1,000 live-born infants. Mortality is usually ranged from 21 to 24% in the literature, and in our study it was about 25%. Morbidity is also still uh, quite high, about 25 to 35%, and especially when it's concerned to neurodevelopmental uh, delay and epilepsy later on in life. And what uh, made us study this problem is that neonatal seizures is still quite uh, a common and serious uh, problem, and many challenges are still there when it comes to diagnosing and treating neonatal seizures. And many studies have been published already on imaging, but usually it was only small groups and specific diagnoses like HIE, for example. In our opinion and in our experience, imaging always contributed quite a lot to making a diagnosis. And in our center, it's, uh, we're accustomed to uh, perform imaging in almost all of our infants that have neonatal seizures. So it was the ideal population to have a look at neonatal seizures in general and then investigate the role of imaging. As the diagnostic accuracy of neonatal seizures is very difficult from a clinical point of view, therefore I would briefly talk about the clinical assessment and how you performed it. Obviously, there is not yet a standardized approach. Prolonged continuous video EEG 
is the gold standard for seizure monitoring on a neonatal intensive care unit, but however, availability remains limited at many centers. I believe it is particularly important that in your study, the study population, seizures have been recorded by either amplitude integrated EEG or a standard EEG. Could you briefly comment and describe how you went about to evaluate the children further from a clinical perspective? Yes, of course. It's true that there are still no evidence-based guidelines when it comes to diagnosing the underlying etiology of neonatal seizures. In our center, it's important, and I think it's also an important point to make, is that it's really important to get confirmation of your neonatal seizures since it has been shown that only clinical seizures, very few cases clinical seizures or about 34% of electrographic seizures have clinical signs, so a lot of neonatal seizures are subclinical. And also, even if there are clinical signs, it's also difficult to pick up um, for a neonatal uh, medical staff. So I think, first of all, it's really important to distinguish between when there are suspected seizures, if there's a real seizure, and for that, uh, of course, video EG is the gold standard, but as you pointed out, it's not available at all centers. So I think a good first step would be to use the uh, limited channel uh, EEG or AEG, and first decide if there's a seizure uh, with an electrographic correlate, yes or no, and then when you have confirmed it on EEG or AEG, then, um, of course, the focus is to find out why they are seizing, so the etiology, and I think the first step is to find the treatable causes like uh, hypoglycemia or other metabolic disturbances by performing some uh, laboratory testing. Of course, the central nervous system infections like meningitis are uh, also a treatable cause, um, which you can find in the, by infection parameters or uh, lumbar puncture. And then of the, I think the sign of venous thrombosis belongs in this row since Treatment can be an option, but that one is usually only found or diagnosed with MRI. And I think the second stage is uh, when you ruled out or found the treatable causes, it's important to find an explanation for your seizures. And usually brain injury is the underlying problem, and usually it's visible on uh, neuroimaging. And I think cranial ultrasound should always be your screening tool. A lot of diagnoses can already be seen on ultrasound, like the uh, intracranial hemorrhages, sometimes uh, uh, strokes, and also some determinants of some hypoxic ischemic uh, encephalopathy. It's an easy to use tool. It's quick. You can do it on admission. So I think that you should try to do that to perform it as soon as possible. And then also, as we showed in our study, I think an MRI is definitely important, especially when you don't have an explanation yet with your uh, previous testing also to determine the extent of the injury, mainly for prognosis purposes. For example, uh, to see the extent of the injury in an arterial ischemic stroke, to see if the flick is involved, or uh, in HIE, if the basal ganglia are involved, since we know that's important for prognosis. Um, and also, well, coming up more and more, I think, are the HIE mimics, where you have a situation mimicking HIE, but the story doesn't completely line up. So I think in those cases, it can also be important to do an MRI, and it can direct your differential diagnosis, for example, for more metabolic testing or genetic testing, and especially the spectroscopy can be important. And finally, I think when there's absolutely no explanation yet, when you've also performed your neuroimaging, I think then uh, genetic and metabolic screening tests come into view. Now, I'd like to continue with some questions concerning technical aspects of neuroradiological evaluation in your study. Do you think that there is anything particular that you could elaborate on? For example, which MRI sequences have made the biggest contribution to the diagnostic value of MRI? First of all, it very much depends on the timing of the onset of the seizures and the time that you're going to do an MRI. I think we are all very much aware of the additional value of especially diffusion-weighted imaging, which is extremely helpful for the HIE group. We know that the basal ganglia are most difficult to diagnose with conventional MRI. The changes during the first couple of days after the insult, but the basal ganglia will highlight 
very much with the diffusion weighted imaging within one or two days after the insult very quickly. So diffusion weighted imaging for the particular group is very helpful as it will be for the children with perinatal stroke. As we have shown in the past, involvement of the cortical spinal tracts, especially the posterior limb and the cerebral peduncle, if they are seen to have high signal intensity on the diffusion, it's a very, very good predictor for a subsequent hemiplegia. And this is not so clearly seen with the conventional imaging, although after a couple of days it may also become more prominent on the T2 or the T1 that the plic is going to be abnormal. The diffusion, I think, is very helpful, especially for those who are not so experienced in looking at the conventional imaging in newborn infants. However, if you are going to uh, prolong the time between the onset of seizures and doing the MRI, then we know that the diffusion-weighted imaging is going to lose its additional value and you get in your pseudo-normalization if you are going to calculate your apparent diffusion coefficients, for instance, in the other conditions, like infection, as we mentioned before, sometimes it's very helpful, again, the diffusion, because it will show as a high signal intensity there's going to be pus in the ventricles, or you're going to see that there's high signal intensity in areas which may be abscess uh, formation. So diffusion may play a role there as well, and in the viral encephalitis, like par echovirus or enterovirus, you will see high signal intensity in the white matter very clearly again, as is shown in herpes infection. In the brainstem, sometimes the diffusion changes are very clearly seen. And in the metabolic disorders, well, it's not really uh, an imaging sequence, but the spectroscopy is sometimes helping us very much and will, have, will tell us the diagnosis even before the people in the lab are going to sort out their things. And we will tell them that we are actually considering a cell vagar disorder by just looking at the spectroscopy. For the children with genetic disorders, the diffusion is not going to be so helpful. But for instance, looking at cortical dysplasia, polymicrogyria, you will just need the uh, thin slices, which should not be like 5 mm, but more like 2 mm slices on a nice T2 sequence to look at the polymicrogyria. So I think for all the different problems, there are going to be specific sequences that you're going to use. And for the, if you see a child with a telemic hemorrhage and you consider cerebral sinovenous thrombosis, the CSVT, then if you're sitting there, you, of course, will consider that you need to do an MR phenography. And the same applies to a stroke. You may want to add your MR angiography. We ourselves are, are usually there during the MRI session, and that is really helpful because it will tell you, well, now I think we need to do an additional sequence like an MRV or an MRA, or we see maybe a hemorrhage, and we would like to have a susceptibility-weighted imaging to confirm it. So there's a whole range of sequences that we can use, which is getting larger and larger, and I think it's extremely helpful to make the right choices at the right time. Do you sometimes perform an MRI twice in a neonate, let's say on day 3 and on day 10 of age? And do you think there is any benefit doing that in terms of diagnosis? Well, at the moment, it's a very nice question that you're asking now. At the moment, there's a lot of discussion, especially in the HIE group, and a little bit upset about the new guidelines from the American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the ACO guidelines that kind of actually support that you should be doing in HIE children the first MRI between 24 and 96 hours and then repeat it again on day 10. And they say that if you do it very early, you may actually tell more definitely whether there might have been an antenatal insult or whether it's really perinatal. Um, but in the children who are being cooled, I think it's actually best to leave them be cooled in the NICU environment and not disturb them too much. So for us, we try to do an MRI after rewarming, and we only repeat the MRI a week later when we see a discrepancy between how the child is behaving. If, for instance, the MRI doesn't really show any changes at all, and we think the child is not doing very well, then we may repeat it. If there are still ongoing seizures, then we may repeat it after a couple of days again to see the full extent of the lesions. But I must say, so far, we haven't really been impressed with additional changes seen during the second MRI. If you do it very early, uh, for the diffusion, you will see changes in an HIE baby, 
but you may see that there is more full-blown pathology in the basal ganglia, uh, while on the initial scan on day one or two, you may just see some diffusion changes in the telomere. So there may be some progression. If you do it too early, I think you may not get the full-blown picture that you may see a couple of days later. Yeah, and I think it's also depending on how, as Dr. Baxter was mentioning before, how bad a neonate is in terms of its, of its encephalopathy. Yes. From a clinical point of view. Now, for the third question regarding technical aspects, not every institution has access to a 3 Tesla MRI. Do you think there is a big benefit compared to a 1.5 Tesla MRI? And what do you think are the minimal technical requirements for an appropriate high-quality cranial ultrasound equipment? Well, to start with the MRI, we are doing most of our new natal MRI on the street Tesla. I do actually think that the, the most important thing is that we should be using new natal sequences and thin slices. And I think if you have a good quality 1.5 Tesla MRI and you have done your two millimeter rather than five millimeter sequences and you have adjusted sequences for the newborn infant, then the quality to see most of the things you're looking for can be dealt with with the 1.5 Tesla MRI. The three Tesla T2 sequence gives a very nice, slightly higher resolution. And if you look for additional sequences like the MRA or the spectroscopy, then this again is slightly better on the three Tesla. But I think what we have been diagnosing, and a lot of the children that were done in the early period of the study were in fact done with a 1.5 Tesla, and I don't think you are likely to miss anything. But quite often we get children from elsewhere that have had in a level 2 hospital an MRI, and even though they have a good 1.5 Tesla magnet, they've been using adult sequences or the child has been moving a lot, and I think that is what makes the difference to go for the new natal sequence, have the two millimeter slices, and hopefully the baby will lie still, and then I think your 1.5 will give you most of the answers. With regards to your ultrasound, um, I think that compared to the past, there are no bad ultrasound machines anymore, and they all have their kind of broadband uh, probe with a 5 to 8 uh, megahertz uh, transducer. And again, I think you might be too early with your ultrasound because your stroke is not going to be visible very often during the first couple of days or your basal ganglia lesions in the HIE babies are also taking a little bit of time to develop. But I think with the equipment which is there and also in the level two hospitals, you can make a lot of diagnosis if it's within your center of view, of field of view, but you're going to miss your more superficial cortical problems, and that's why you also want to do your MRI. You don't want to miss a cell vaker with polymicrogyria, who is like a, a mimic encephalopathy when he's coming in. Now, we could move on to the neuroimaging findings, although you have been already talking about that a little bit. Uh, the differential diagnosis of neonatal seizures is broad and includes structural, metabolic, and genetic causes, as you were um, mentioning already. But would you like to discuss what your results have shown in regards to the spectrum of etiology of neonatal seizures? Uh, yes, of course. Um, well, obviously, we found a spectrum of etiologies in our large cohort. As I mentioned before, the most common ones were the HIE, the hemorrhages, and the stroke. Obviously, every etiology has its specific characteristics. Uh, for example, in the HIE, usually you see two very common patterns, one where the basal ganglia and telomere are, are more commonly involved and one where the watershed area, so more the white matter or cortex, uh, uh, is involved. Uh, so that's usually what you search for in your HIE and what we also found in our study. I think it's also important to mention with regard to the neuroimaging results per etiology is what each modality, uh, so ultrasound and MRI, uh, contribute. And, for example, in HIE, when you, you perform your ultrasound, as Linda mentioned, you can sometimes find the echogenicity in the white matter or also the basal ganglia, but it's quite difficult. So usually uh, the MRI can confirm that and also show the extent of the lesions, especially the diffusion. And for the hemorrhages, obviously that's usually 
very well visible with ultrasound. MRI usually adds to that for the more uh, extra axial uh, hemorrhages, uh, posterior fossa hemorrhages, or arterial uh, venous malformations, which you can diagnose with the MRI, with the MRI uh, in particular. Well, and Linda also already mentioned that for stroke, it can be difficult in the early days uh, to diagnose that with ultrasound. And also here, the MRI A can contribute, and the diffusion is extremely important. When it comes to, for example, the CNS infections, the meningitis or the encephalitis, I think it's um, important to note that usually the MRI or also the ultrasound lesions can be defined by the causing organism. It has been described by some studies in the literature, and we also try to list what findings we found in our study. Well, for example, in B. streptococci, the GBS infections, those are often, uh, for example, associated with ischemic infarctions. And in the herpes infections, you can find temporal uh, DVI uh, diffusion uh, changes. And Linda already mentioned the diffusion abnormalities for the, the viruses, uh, like uh, per echo and um, rotavirus. I think for the uh, metabolic disorders, especially the inborn errors, they show a wide range of abnormalities, and I think it's uh, we don't have enough time to go over those uh, at the moment. But most importantly, I would like to point out that MR spectroscopy is very helpful in these cases because in 82% of our infants with an inborn error of metabolism, it showed an abnormal spectroscopy, for example, usually a lactate peak. And, uh, of course, uh, also the, the cerebral dysgenesis is also very variable with um, many different lesions that we found, like polymicrogyria or cortical dysplasia, heterotopia. It can be uh, quite a lot, so I think that's um, beyond the scope of this uh, podcast. So you are listing inborn error of metabolism, but also genetic findings. Now, I was wondering, where did you put your cases? Uh, you might have had some of vitamin B6 dependent epilepsy. How do you approach these? Yeah, that's a good question. I can understand the confusion between the group that we define as genetic and the inborn errors of metabolism, which also quite often have a genetic correlate. So in our study, we defined genetic mostly as the, the B9 familial neonatal seizures for which we found a mutation in, for example, the KCNQ2 gene. And when uh, it was a genetic uh, mutation in, in some gene which led to an inborn error of metabolism, that was defined as an inborn error of metabolism. And the pyridoxin, I don't think we had any. Did we have any in this? No, story? we didn't have any pyridoxin deficiency cases, unfortunately. Okay, interesting. So I think you addressed almost all of my questions so far. Would you like to add something in regards to timing and gestational age, and in which case it is particularly important to perform an MRI? Yes, that's a very good question, especially since in many centers it's not as easily available. Of course, in our study we showed that it's a very helpful tool in the diagnostic process, so preferably we would like to have an MRI in all uh, term infants with seizures. But I think it's especially important when you have confirmed seizures with all your other testing and all your other imaging like ultrasound, you have not found an explanation. So I think then it's important to perform an MRI and it doesn't necessarily matter at which time. Also, when you have suspected sinovenous thrombosis, for example, when you find thalamic hemorrhage in a the, in the term baby or an IVH, then the only way to actually confirm the diagnosis is MR venography. So I think those are important. And when it comes down to predicting prognosis, for example, in HIE and in stroke, then your diffusion really adds to the information. But that one, as we mentioned before, should be um, performed uh, within seven days of the onset of seizures. So that should be taken into account. Lastly, as we also mentioned before, the HIE mimics when the story of HIE does not completely add up and maybe you would have to do some further testing, then MRI can give you clues which way to go. Sometimes preterm babies have seizures too. How do we deal with them? I, I'm interested how we would deal with them or do we have planned further studies on that spectrum of study population or possible population? Not as a subsequent study from this one, 
but of course, uh, actually, the seizure burden in uh, preterms is even higher. But we excluded that from this study since their etiology and, uh, is, is quite different. Uh, usually, you see more the hemorrhages uh, that cause the seizures in the preterms. And I think it's important to note that in preterms, obviously, they are a special population, so it's usually a little bit more difficult to, for example, to perform an MRI. And I think when you look at the most common etiologies in preterms, I think your bedside ultrasound, you can already diagnose most. And I don't think the risk of taking a baby so fragile to the MRI is, is worth the risk. So in preterms, I think when you have your EEG and you can see the seizures, and especially in preterms, they're often subclinical, so you really need your EEG uh, and usually long-term monitoring to even spot the seizures. So have your long-term monitoring EEG, have your ultrasound, and obviously laboratory testing for other underlying causes, but I think then you're, you have it quite well covered. We've now come to the end of our podcast. Many thanks indeed to Lauren, Linda and Sarah for a very interesting and clinically very important discussion. Just to remind our listeners, the article's by Vika et al. It's in the March 2015 issue of the journal.